This is the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter, 2021. Lesson 6 for May 1 to 7, Abraham's Seed, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, May 1. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we come to study your word again, as we look at what it means to be Abraham's seed, as we find what happens to us and how we become part of Abraham's seed, we ask for your blessing on each of us, whether we're listening in Iran or in Pakistan or in Africa or in the Middle East or in Europe or America or Australia or South America, we pray, Lord, that you'll be with us and bless us. May your Holy Spirit guide us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But ye are a holy generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Let's read that again, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. In a small town, the clock in the jeweller's window stopped one day at a quarter to nine. Many of their citizens had been depending on this clock to know the time. On this particular morning, Businessmen and women glanced in the window and noticed that it was only fifteen minutes to nine. Children on their way to school were surprised to find they still had plenty of time to loiter. Many persons were late that morning because one small clock in the jeweller's window had stopped. And that's by C. L. Paddock from God's Minutes, uh, page 244, published in 1965. How accurate a representation of ancient Israel's failure. The Lord placed Israel in the midst of the nations, as it says in Ezekiel 5, verse 5, in the strategic bridge land between three continents, Africa, Europe and Asia. They were to be the spiritual clock of the world. Israel, however, stopped in a sense like the clock in the jeweller's window, yet it was not a total failure. For then, as today, God has his faithful remnant. Our study this week focuses on the identity and role of God's true Israel in every age, including our own. And here's the week at a glance. What covenant promises did the Lord make to Israel? What conditions came with them? How well did the nation abide by those promises? And what happened when they disobeyed? Sunday, May 2. Above all people. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 6 reads, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. There is no question about it. The Lord specifically had chosen the Hebrew people to be his special representatives upon the earth. The word translated as special in the above verse, sergula, can mean valued property or peculiar treasure. The crucial point to remember too is that this choice was totally the act of God, an expression of His grace. There was nothing found in the people themselves that made them deserve His grace. There couldn't be, because grace is something that comes undeserved. Question, read Ezekiel 16, verse 8. How does it help explain the Lord's choosing of Israel? Ezekiel 16, verse 8. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says 
the Lord God. Writing in uh, his book titled Deuteronomy, pages 130 and 131, J. A. Thompson writes, Why was Israel chosen by Yahweh? That was inscrutable. She was a small group of people without great culture or prestige. She possessed no special personal qualities which would warrant such a choice. The election was the act of God alone. The ultimate cause for that choice lay in the mystery of divine love. Yet the fact is that God did love Israel and did choose her, thereby honouring his promise to the fathers. She had been chosen in virtue of Yahweh's love for her. She had been liberated from slavery in Egypt by a display of Yahweh's power. Let her once grasp these great facts, and she would realise that she was indeed a holy and especially treasured people. And the tendency on her part, therefore, to surrender such a noble status was reprehensible in the extreme. End of quote. According to the divine plan, the Israelites were to be both a royal and a priestly race. In an evil world, they were to be kings, moral and spiritual, in that they were to prevail over the realm of sin. As priests, they were to draw near to the Lord in prayer, in praise, and in sacrifice. As intermediaries between God and the heathen, they were to serve as instructors, preachers, and prophets, and were to be examples of holy living. Heaven's exponents of true religion. And so to finish today, look at the phrase in the verse for today in which the Lord says that they were to be above all people of the earth. Considering all that the Word has taught about the virtue of humility and the danger of pride, what do you think that verse means? In what ways were they to be above all the people? Should we apply that idea to ourselves as a church as well? If so, how? Monday, May 3. Land Deal. Our text for today is Genesis 35 and verse 12. The land which I gave Abraham and Isaac I give to you and to your descendants after you I give this land. The promise that a land would be given to God's people, Israel, was first given to Abraham and then repeated to Isaac and Jacob. Joseph's deathbed words repeated this promise in Genesis 50, verse 24. And Joseph said to his brethren, I am dying, but God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land, to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. God informed Abraham, however, that 400 years would pass before the seed of Abraham would take possession of the land. We read that Last week, but let's read that again in Genesis 15, verse 13. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And verse 16, But in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Fulfilment of the promise began in the days of Moses and Joshua. Moses repeated the promise in the divine command in Deuteronomy 1.8, Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and take possession of the land. And then we read in Deuteronomy 28, 1. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. And verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. What is implied in these words? In short, the land would be given to Israel as part of the covenant. A covenant implies obligations. What obligations did Israel 
have. The first part of Deuteronomy 28 outlines the blessings Israel would receive if they followed God's will. The other section of the chapter deals with the curses that would befall them if they did not. These curses, as we read in the pulpit commentary on Deuteronomy, were largely, though not wholly, brought about by simply giving sin scope to work out in its own evil results, as Galatians 6 8. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Like water, which left to itself will not cease running till it has found its level, like a clock, which left to itself will not cease going till it has run itself completely down, like a tree, which left to grow cannot but bring forth its appropriate fruit, so sin has a level to seek, a course to run, a fruit to mature, and the end of those things is death. End of quote. Despite all the promises of land, those promises were not unconditional. They came as part of a covenant. Israel had to fulfil her end of the bargain. If not, the promises could be nullified. The Lord made it very clear, more than once, that if they disobeyed, the land would be taken from them. Read Leviticus 26, 27 to 33. It's hard to imagine how the Lord could have been more explicit with his words. Leviticus 26, beginning at verse 27. And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. I will lay your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries to desolation, and I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. I will bring the land to desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations, and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste." And so, to finish the day, as Christians, we look forward to receiving and keeping the promised lands of heaven and the earth made new. They have been promised to us, just as the earthly promised land was to the Hebrews. The difference, however, is that once we get there, there is no chance of our ever losing it, as we read in Daniel 7.18. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever even forever and ever. At the same time, there are conditions for getting there. How do you understand what these conditions are, especially in the context of salvation by faith alone? Tuesday, May 4, Israel and the Covenant. Our text for today is Jeremiah chapter 11 and verse 8. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. Look at the above text. The Lord says that he will bring upon them all the words of this covenant. Yet, he is talking about something bad. Though we tend to think of the covenant as offering us only something good, there's the flip side. This principle was seen with Noah. God offered Noah something wonderful, preservation from destruction, but Noah had to obey in order to receive the blessings of God's grace. If he did not, the other side of the covenant would follow. Question. Compare the above text with Genesis 6-5 regarding the pre-flood world. What's the parallel? What do these verses say about how important it is for us to control our thoughts? 
First of all, we'll go back to our text for today, Jeremiah eleven eight. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. And Genesis 6, verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Unfortunately, for the most part, the history of national Israel was a repeated pattern of apostasy followed by divine judgments, repentance, and a period of obedience. Only briefly under David and Solomon did Israel control the full extent of the promised territory. Look at these texts from Jeremiah regarding Israel's apostasy. Jeremiah 3, verse 1 and 20. They say, if a man puts away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Surely, as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. This brings up something touched upon earlier. The covenant God wants with us is not merely some cold legal agreement made between business people looking to cut the best deal for themselves. The covenant relationship is a commitment, one as serious and sacred as marriage, which is why the Lord uses the imagery that he does. The point is that Israel's apostasy did not have its root in disobedience, but in a broken personal relationship with the Lord, a break that resulted in disobedience that finally brought punishment upon them. And so to finish the day, why is the personal, relational aspect so crucial in the Christian life? Why, if our relationship with God isn't right, are we so prone to fall into sin and disobedience? Also, what would you say to someone who asked this question? How can I develop a deep, loving relationship with God? Wednesday, May 5, The Remnant Despite Israel's repeated cycle of apostasy, divine judgments and repentance, what hope is found in these following texts? Isaiah 4, verse 3, And it shall come to pass that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, every one who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem. And Micah 4, verses 6 and 7, In that day, says the Lord, I will assemble the lame, I will gather the outcast, and those whom I have afflicted. I will make the lame a remnant, and the outcast a strong nation. So the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from now on, even forever. And Zephaniah chapter 3 verses 12 and 13. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. Although God's plan for ancient Israel was spoiled by disobedience, it was never completely frustrated. Among the weeds, a few flowers still grew. Many of the Old Testament prophets speak of this faithful remnant whom God would gather unto himself as a lovely bouquet. The purpose of God in creating and preserving a faithful remnant was the same as it had been for all of Israel, to use them as his divinely appointed instruments for declaring my glory among the nations, as in Isaiah 66.19. By this means, others would join the faithful to, as it says in Zechariah 14.16, worship the king, 
the Lord of hosts. Thus, no matter how bad the situation became, God always had some faithful people who, despite apostasy within the ranks of God's chosen people, kept their own calling and election sure, as we read in Second Peter 1.10. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. In short, whatever the failings of the nation as a whole, there were still those who tried to keep, as best they could, their end of the covenant. For instance, as in First Kings 19, verses 14 to 18, And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken their covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel-Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And though perhaps they suffered with their nation as a whole, such as when exiled from the land, the final and ultimate covenant promise will be theirs, that of eternal life. Read John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. What is Jesus saying there? Apply his words and promises in them to the situation regarding apostasy in ancient Israel. How do these words help explain the existence of a faithful remnant? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any one snatch them out of my hand. And so to finish today, a few years ago a young woman gave up her Christian faith entirely, mostly because she was discouraged by the sin, apostasy and hypocrisy she saw in her local church. Those people weren't really Christians, she said, using that as an excuse to give up everything. Why is her excuse not valid? Base your answer on the principles of today's study. Thursday, May 6. Spiritual Israel Whatever the mistakes and failings of ancient Israel, the Lord was not finished with the plan of creating a faithful people to serve him. In fact, the Old Testament looked forward to a time when the Lord would create a spiritual Israel, a faithful body of believers, Jews and Gentiles, who would carry on the work of preaching the gospel to the world. Welcome to the early church. Read Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29, and then there are five questions coming after that. Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Question 1. What promise is Paul talking about in Galatians 3.29? And if you are in Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. 2. What is the key element that makes a person an heir to these promises? Verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 
and three, why is Paul breaking down distinctions of gender, nationality and social status? Four, what does it mean to be one in Christ? And five, read Romans chapter 4 verses 16 and 17. How do these verses help us understand what Paul is saying in Galatians three twenty-six to 29? Romans 4, beginning at verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. As a son of Abraham, Christ became, in a special sense, heir to the covenant promises. By baptism, we acquire kinship to Christ and through him acquire the right to participate in the promises made to Abraham. Thus, all that God promised Abraham is found in Christ, and the promises become ours, not because of nationality, race or gender, but through grace, which God bestows upon us through faith, as we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 170, written by Ellen G. White. The gift to Abraham and his seed included not merely the land of Canaan, but the whole earth. So says the Apostle, the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed, through the law, but through the righteousness of faith as it says in Romans 4.13. And the Bible plainly teaches that the promises made to Abraham are to be fulfilled through Christ. Believers become heirs to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away. 1 Peter 1.4 The earth freed from the curse of sin. End of quote. This promise will be fulfilled literally when the saints live on the new earth forever and ever with Christ, as we read in Daniel 7.27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Friday, May 7. No distinction on account of nationality, race or caste is recognised by God, Ellen White writes in Prophets and Kings, page 369 and 370. He is the maker of all mankind. All men are of one family by creation, and all are one through redemption. Christ came to demolish every wall of petition, to throw open every compartment of the temple courts, that every soul may have free access to God. His love is so broad, so deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. It lifts out of Satan's influence those who have been deluded by his deceptions, and places them within reach of the throne of God, the throne encircled by the rainbow of promise. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. End of quote. Read First Peter chapter two verses nine and ten to discover the four titles Peter applies to the church. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Most of these titles are reflected in the following Old Testament texts that refer to Israel. Exodus 19, verse 6, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children 
of Israel. And Isaiah 43, verse 20, The beast of the field will honour me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. What does each of these titles emphasise about the church's relationship to God? For example, the title Chosen Nation emphasises the fact that God chose the church and has a specific destiny for it. And that brings us to our discussion questions for this week. And there are three. One, in ancient Israel, the priests made animal sacrifices that pointed to the Messiah. As members of a royal priesthood, what types of sacrifices are church members to make? First Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 2. God separated Israel from the world so it could be a holy nation. It also was to share salvation truths with the world. The same is true for the church today. How is it possible to be separated from the world while at the same time to be in a position to share the gospel with the world? How do Israel's experience and Jesus' example help us to answer this question? And three, God always maintained a remnant with an ancient Israel. Consider Elijah and the remnant that existed during his time, as you read in 1 Kings chapter 19, and we'll especially focus on verse 18. Why is it often easier to be true to God in the midst of worldly people than in the midst of backsliding members of one own church family? 1 Kings chapter 19, and there are 21 verses. Let's begin at verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life, and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then, as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights, as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken their covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. 
Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. And then verse 18. Yet I have reserved seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat, who was ploughing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the twelfth. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him, and took a yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them, and boiled their flesh, using the oxen's equipment, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose, and followed Elijah, and became his servant. And so, for the summary of this week's lesson, God's true Israel, whether before or after the cross, is the Israel of faith, persons who live in a spiritual covenant relationship with him. Such people function as his representatives, holding out to the world the gospel of his saving grace. Inside Story our mission story this week is titled Every Step of the Way, and once again it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Dr. Hernando Diaz was desperate. He hadn't worked as a physician for two years because of his two-year-old son's illness. He needed a house and a job. Hernando moved his family from their hometown in northern Colombia to Medellin, the country's second largest city, in hopes of finding a hospital to treat Samuel's kidney problems. But after living in the hospital for a year, he needed a house for Samuel, his wife Erica, and their 11-year-old son, Emma. Nothing seemed affordable near the hospital. He prayed and found a house whose owner rented rooms to students. He asked for a room. I only have one room left and a student has paid for it, the owner said. Look, Hernando said, God brought me here because I need that room. The owner gave him the room rent-free for six months. With that kind gesture, Hernando was certain that God was leading him. Emma had lived with relatives in another city for a year, and Hernando wanted to enrol him in a Christian school near the hospital. A hospital receptionist heard about his request. I know a good Christian school nearby, she said. My niece studied there. It's Seventh-day Adventist. Hernando wasn't familiar with the Adventist church, but a visit to the school impressed him and Emma started classes. Shortly into the school year, Emma informed the teacher that his father was a physician. Tell him to give his resume so I can submit it to the Adventist clinic, the teacher said. She knew that the Adventist medical centre on the campus of Columbia Adventist University was struggling to find a physician. Emma told his father, and Hernando gave his resume to the teacher. I want to work, but I can't because I need to be with my baby, he said. Don't worry, the teacher said. Just show up for the interview. When the clinic called him for an interview, Hernando explained his need for a flexible schedule. He was hired on the spot. We'll work with your schedule, the director said, adding that he could help with Samuel's paperwork. A grateful Hernando joined the clinic's team. He became acquainted with the Adventist faith and accepted an invitation to attend church. His understanding of God's love grew. The Adventists were hospitable, humble and sincerely interested in helping me, he said. I brought my family to church. Hernando and his family were baptised into the Adventist church. Today, Samuel is a healthy eight-year-old boy and Hernando works full-time at the Adventist Medical Centre where he has led more than 100 patients and others to Christ through his personal testimony. Hernando believes that God led him every step of the way. Other hospitals wouldn't work with me, he said. It was a miracle that the Adventist clinic 
hired me. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.